Okay, let's get started. Uh, so, uh, test number three, as I mentioned on the, the listserv, the, the grades were uh, quite good. That's what I was looking for. Other than, uh, just as a, as a reminder, make sure you answer the whole question. Uh, other than that, I really don't have any additional comments. They're right up there. Um, uh, please just make sure to look at the answer key. You can get a problem right. You know, maybe perhaps I approach the problem differently so you can learn uh, from uh, how I approach the problem. So please make sure you take a look at all the parts of the answer key. Are there any questions about the exam? So uh, with respect to grades for the semester, uh, what I've done is I've posted all the grades um, that you have received in this course to Blackboard. And so you can go through the usual mechanisms uh, for how to access your grades on Blackboard. If you're not for sure exactly how to do that, please come talk to me after class. Um, and so what I've done is uh, broken up the grades, as you might expect. Again, according to the syllabus, the project's quizzes part of your grade is 25% of your overall grade. Uh, test 1 is 5%, test 2 is 25%, test 3 is 25%. So in Blackboard, I've also calculated what your current grade is for the class. And the way that you simply find that is, of course, you can take 25% times projects and quizzes, 5% times test number 1, and so on. And then divide everything by 0.8. The reason why I do it by 0.8 is because the finals were 20% of your grade. And so you have received so far 80% of all of your grades. Thank you. And so just as, as an example here, you know, let's say on the projects and quizzes, you got 95%, test 1, 90%. Uh, test number 285% and test 395%. <coughs> Your current grade will be 91.56, which would then translate into uh, A minus for the course so far. Um, so that's the information that's presented there. Please go take a look at it before the final exam. Uh, make sure you understand where you are standing in this course. And also, you know, there's always the possibility I might have made it a, a, a great entry error. So. You know, please make sure that um, like you let me know if there are any errors in how I've entered the grades. Um, also, with respect to Blackboard and grades, I can't actually see exactly what you see when you look at your grade. Um, so because of that, there might be some additional information displayed, like summary information that Blackboard uh, will sometimes present, like what was the average grade on a test, for example. That's not necessarily correct. You know, what I've given you in our class is what is correct. Uh, so please ignore any other additional information than what is uh, stated there. Okay, are there any questions about that? Okay, so let's take a look at what we're going to do for the rest of the semester, which means, I guess, then the rest of this week. Uh, we will simply just take a look at multinomial regression models for classification purposes. This is going to be an extension to logistic regression models in the sense that logistic regression works for, let's say if you had two populations, multinomial regression works up to, let's say, J populations. But the model is very similar and the process is very similar. Unfortunately, we will not get to the testing means part and also the random force part. Um, we can't do everything, unfortunately. I had hoped that we could, but we're not going to be able to. Um, I... I do not have lecture notes online for random force. I do have lecture notes online for testing means. Um, you're welcome to take a look at them, uh, but we will not cover them directly in class. I'll probably just spend maybe at most five minutes next time just briefly talking about what you've missed. It's not much, but you know I think it's still good just to briefly mention what, what, what you guys have missed with respect to that. Um, 
And then, of course, then our final exam is in this classroom uh, one week from tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m. Okay. It's been a quick semester. Are there any questions before we go on here? Okay, let's talk about multinomial regression then. So let's first of all talk about what the multinomial probability distribution is. I would imagine that all of you have had it, but I guess there's a chance that you may not, depending upon if it was covered in your 801-like course. Um, basically, what a multinomial probability distribution is, is the extension of a binomial distribution, where a binomial, you know, you have two categories for your outcome, let's say, a success or a failure, y equal 1, y equals 0. Multinomial allows you to have, let's say, up to j different, let's say, response categories uh, that, that could be up, up observed. And so this is what the, so also, uh, let me mention, for those of you who have me for STAT 875, uh, you know, unfortunately there will be some uh, review here uh, over stuff that you've already seen in STAT 875. Uh, we can't necessarily get around it. But in the end, the purpose here uh, for what we're going to be doing with multinomial regression is different from what you've seen in STAT 875. In 875, you're focused more on interpretation of the model. Here we're, we're, we're focused on uh, classification, determining which population observation came from. Okay, so again, multinomial distribution is an extension of a binomial distribution. And let me get my red pen out here. So let's let Y then be uh, our response that says, well, what category do we observe? J equal 1, J equal 2, J up to, let's say, capital J. And this is what the multinomial uh, probability distribution looks like. And let me explain the notation here. Little n here is the total number of trials. So just like with a binomial distribution, you, know, you have n trials. Well, here we have n trials as well. I'm going to use a lowercase n, though, at this moment. Uh, so, you know, perhaps let's say that, um, uh, uh, I guess a classic example of a multinomial response would be, let's say, uh, you have some questions on a survey that are measured on a Likert scale. <coughs> and you have uh, five different possible response cate uh, categories that someone can choose from, where, let's say, one might be uh, very dissatisfied, two is, <coughs> excuse me, two is dissatisfied, three is neutral, four is... Uh, Satisfied five is very satisfied, and perhaps you know on a survey maybe you have five questions just like this, and so a person then uh, uh, then contributes um, essentially five different responses, and if we are just interested in let's say their overall summary of all the responses, you know maybe we might uh, uh, what well, we would observe then let's say five different responses. And, you know, maybe, for example, you might observe, let's say, maybe, um, you know, uh, let me erase that. You might observe three times a person picked response one, zero time for two, zero time for three, one for four, one for five. Okay? And the way then we denote then that the count of these responses is by these ends, again, but we have a little subscript here. Uh, with the ends to say, well, which category are you talking about? So in this case, N1 is 3, N2 is 0, and so on. Now, the probability of, having, of, of, of choosing a particular response category, then, is then denoted by pi 1, pi 2, down to pi sub 5 in this particular case. So pi sub 1 is the probability that you respond a 1. To, uh, pi 2 is the probability you respond with a 2, and so on. And if we put all that stuff together, then this is what the probability distribution looks like. So again, if you're interested in what's the probability someone has an n1 equal 3, n2 equals 0, n3 equals 0, n4 equals 1, n5 equals 1, if you know the pi's, you've got the corresponding probability. 
Um, to relate this to the binomial distribution, let's say instead j was equal to 2. And look what happens. We get n factorial over n1 factorial times n2 factorial times pi 1 raised to the n1 times pi 2 raised to the n2. So it's starting to look a little bit like the binomial distribution that definitely all of you are used to seeing. And we can further simplify this. We can have n factorial over uh, n1 factorial, then n minus n2 factorial, oops, n minus n1 factorial, I should say. There should be a 1 there. So notice since your total number of responses, n, uh, n1 plus n2, that is equal to n, so n2 then equivalently is n minus n1. And we have pi 1. And then we have 1 minus pi 1 raised to the appropriate powers. So 1 minus pi 1 comes about because pi 1 plus pi 2 would be equal to 1, because either you're in category 1 or 2. Okay. So you can see how then the multinomial distribution with capital J equal 2 is equivalent to a binomial. Any questions about that? Please note this little small error there. I forgot a subscript. Now sometimes what you will have is actually n observations of n sub r trials for maybe, let's say, everyone in a survey. So let's say if everyone in, in participating in a survey, you know, ends up responding five different times, then what you could do now is, again, summarize this using a multinomial distribution, which in this case, then, we end up having a likelihood function where we are taking the product of over all R equal 1 to capital N individuals, let's say, participating in your survey. So it's exactly what we had above, except for now I designate well which observation we're talking about. Relative to the survey example, which person are we talking about in the survey? And all that together gives us our likelihood function. Okay. Now let's extend this idea to multinomial regression. Um, now we're going to let pi here, pi 1, pi 2, down to pi sub capital J, we're going to let that be a function of independent variables, covariance or explanatory variables, whatever you want to call the x's. Just like what we did with logistic regression. You know, we allow them the probability of success, denoted by pi, to be a function of some independent variables. Well, it makes sense then that you might want to allow them the, the probability of choosing category 1, probability of choosing category 2, 3, 4, or whatever, be functions of independent variables as well. And so, essentially what this is going to be is the extension of a logistic regression model to a J category setting. Okay. So... Here again are our probabilities. Probability choosing category 1, 2, down to capital J. Now since we have more than two categories, um, we have to uh, make some adjustments of how we view these kinds of models. What I'm going to try to model on the left-hand side of my equation, just like what we did with logistic regression, we had log of pi over 1 minus pi. Now on my left hand side of my equation, I'm going to have log of pi sub little j divided by pi 1. Or little j equal 2 to capital J. So what that means then is that on my left side of my model, I'm going to have pi sub 2, I'm sorry, log of pi sub 2 divided by pi sub 1, sometimes. Other times, I'm going to have log of pi sub 3 divided by pi sub 1, sometimes. And all the way down to log of pi sub capital J divided by pi 1 um, on my left-hand side of my, my model statement. 
So notice here that we're basically comparing everything to pi 1. I could have chose pi 2. I could have chose pi 3. I could, I could have made some other comparison. Uh, it, it's not going to matter, as you will see shortly. Um, we're going to choose pi 1 because that's what, how R, how R right, uh, estimates the models. So that's always going to be on the left-hand side of the model. And again, if capital J, the number of categories, is equal to 2, we get what we saw with the logistic regression model. So log of pi 2 divided by pi 1, of course, would be log of pi 2 divided by 1 minus pi 2. So pi 1 plus pi 2 has to be equal to 1. And if I just simply let pi be equal to pi 2, you see exactly what we got with the logistic regression model. Exactly. Now, on the, on the right-hand side of the model, then, we want to... Ah, oh, that's not good. On the right-hand side of our model, what we're going to do, just like what we did with logistic regression, we're going to put a linear combination of our betas with our independent variables. Just to make things simple for now, let's say that we just have one independent variable. I'm just going to call it X. But what's different is, notice I have a subscript here, uh, an extra subscript on the betas, corresponding to J that you see on the left-hand side. So instead of, let's say, being able to write out your model in just one line, like what we did with the logistic regression model, now we have capital J minus one lines of basically writing out what our model would actually be. Because we're looking at log of pi 2 divided by pi 1. We're looking at log of pi 3 divided by pi 1, and so on. All simultaneously. And so with each of these comparisons, then, we have potentially a different beta that we have to estimate. This is called a multinomial regression model. Other names for this model that you might see elsewhere are, for example, a nominal multinomial regression model. I'm using the word nominal here to mean that we're not necessarily saying, at least right now, even though I, I did give an example earlier that kind of violates that, uh, we're not saying, let's say, category 2 is greater than category 1, or category 3 is greater than category 2. We're not going to make any kind of distinction like that. You can for other kinds of regre um, regression models with a multinomial response. We're not going to do that here. Um, so some people might refer to this more specifically as a nominal multinomial regression model. Other people might call it a baseline logit model because notice we have these essentially these logits that we saw with logistic regression model and we make comparisons to a baseline category, category 1 in this particular case. So those are other common names that people use for these kinds of models. So again, it, as I mentioned before, it doesn't really matter the fact that we are only focusing on category 1 in this particular case to make our comparisons to, because we can easily change the model or, or see what the model, what the CISA model gives us if we were, let's say, to compare category 2 to category 3. So for example, if I write out uh, simply a, a, a subtraction of log of pi 2 divided by pi 1, minus log of pi 3 divided by pi 1. You do some math using properties of logarithms. Then you get log of pi 2 divided by pi 3. Well, what happens then to the right-hand side of your, of your model? Well, let's subtract now this linear combination of the betas with the independent variable. So that's what I do. I do a little bit of algebra, rearranging the terms. And now I have the model essentially re-expressed for comparing category 2 to category 3. So that's why it's not a big deal what you choose for the, the comparison category. You can always get to another category, another comparison, I should say. Then the extension to uh, as many explanatory variables essentially as you want. Let's call it P. And as you might expect, this is what we get. Any questions? Okay, so... That's what our model looks like. You might be asking yourself now, well, what if I want to know what is then the probability of, of choosing category one for 
uh, this situation? What's the probability of choosing category 2 in this situation? Because in the end, you're not really cared about what the log of pi 2 divided by pi 1 is. You want to know, well, what's pi 1? What's pi 2? Well, how do we find that in the context of our model? It's not too difficult. It's just a matter of doing some algebra. Okay. So let's consider the case again where we have one independent variable. Um, and so let me come back up here. <coughs> now I'll just write it out again. So let's look at log of pi j divided by pi 1 equal to beta j0 plus beta j1 times x. Okay. So I want to solve for pi 1. It's just a matter of doing some algebra. So this implies then that we have uh, pi j divided by pi 1 is equal to exp beta j0 plus beta j1x. So just using properties of logarithms and an exponential function. Then, how about first of all, I simply solve for pi sub j. So that means I get pi, pi j is equal to pi 1 times then the exponential function uh, rate of uh, beta j0 plus beta j1 times x. Now here's the, the, the important thing. These pi's have to add up to 1. So in the context of our model structure then that means that we have pi 1 plus pi 2 which would be pi 1 raised to the e to the Oh, that's a little typo there. That J should be a 2. So pi 1 times E to the beta 2, 0 plus beta 2, 1 times X. Plus do the same thing for pi 3. Do the same thing all the way to pi sub capital J. Change that little J there to a capital J. Set that equal to 1. Notice each of these terms on the left-hand side have pi 1 in common. So we could factor out pi 1. So we get pi 1 times then 1 plus this e to the uh, 2, 0 plus e to the beta 2, 0 plus uh, beta 2, 1 times x plus all the way down to the uh, jth category. That's equal to 1. Move that stuff that's in the brackets over on to the left hand, I'm sorry, over to the right hand side. Um, do some summation notation. Come on, computer, work for me. And now we have an expression for what pi 1 would be in terms of our model. Then, what we can do is use this expression up here, for what pi sub j then would be. Just plug in the value of pi 1, and you get this. So that's what the individual pi's are in terms of our model structure. Okay. Now that we have that, <coughs> excuse me, now we can think about estimation. So let's go back up to when we first saw a likelihood function for a multinomial distribution. Now what you can do is wherever you see a pi sub j here, plug in what pi sub j is in terms of our model. And again, since these, are, these pi sub j's are functions of our x's, that means each of the pi's could be different for every single, let's say, individual that we sample. So now that you have a likelihood function, what should you do to it? Maximize it. Find then the corresponding betas that maximize it. Those are your maximal likelihood estimates. Unfortunately, you're rarely, if ever, going to be able to do this by hand. So you're going to have to use numerical iterative procedures to do the, um, the optimization problem. Uh, and um, just like with logistic regression, and there's a function R called multinome that does it for us. Okay.
This multi-nome function uh, resides in the NNET package, uh, which actually stands for neural networks. Um, it's based upon uh, the actual coding itself is based upon uh, uh, some relationships to neural things called neural networks. And this NNET or uh, the NNET uh, package is actually uh, uh, installed in R by default. So you don't need to download it. It's already in R itself. And it's uh, written by one of our favorite authors of packages, Brian Ripley. Um, so let's take a look at an example of how we can estimate a mo our model. And then we'll get into the main reason why we are actually talking about multinomial regression, and that is for classification purposes. So we're going to look at an example that should look familiar to you. This is the wheat kernels data set that you've seen previously. Uh, all, as you've seen previously, observation number 31, well, that uh, looked to be a, um, uh, an incorrect measurement, so it was removed from the data set. So I'm going to do that here as well. And just to review this particular example, if you remember, we have some wheat kernels. And we have three different categories for these wheat kernels. They're either healthy sprout or scab. These categories were determined by uh, someone actually looking at the kernels and identifying them that way. And uh, with each of the wheat kernels, then, we have some automated measurements taken upon them. The density, hardness, size, weight, and moisture content of the kernels. These are going to be independent variables for us. We also have information about was this wheat kernel uh, from soft red, red, uh, soft red winter wheat or hard red winter wheat. So I read in the data, as you've done uh, uh, previously. This is what it looks like. Uh, please note that uh, the, the class variable in terms of hard red winter wheat or soft red winter wheat, notice how it's coded as a um, character. Uh, we'll talk about the ramifications of that coming up. We have some plots. We have some nice, um, <coughs> excuse me. Huh. problem stalking today. Uh, we have some nice star plots. Um, we have some parallel coordinates plots. Uh, and uh, you've seen this particular plot before. I just want to point out again the important features of this plot. And that is, uh, notice the green corresponds to scab. Notice for the density, uh, we tend to have more greens down here. For the size, we have more greens down there. Weight, uh, we have some more greens down there as well, meaning that um, often they are smaller than uh, sprout or scab. Uh, we do still have some greens like mixed in in here as well, so we can't ignore those, but we do have a number of scabs that have lower density, for example. And so what that's telling us then is that we might have some success. I'm not saying that we're going to be perfect, but we might have some success then in uh, trying to classify the observations as, as uh, scat. Uh, but we do also see a lot of overlap, especially between uh, uh, sprout and healthy and sprout and scab. We see a lot uh, more so sprout and healthy. Uh, we see a lot of overlap there saying that, okay, we might have some problems in differentiating between the two. So given that information there, don't get your hopes up that we're going to have 100% correct classification rate. Uh, some other uh, parallel coordinates plots that I did was, uh, and you can, all my codes in my corresponding program here. Um, uh, another thing that I did here was, you know, it's kind of hard to see here. Let me see if I can blow this up a little bit. We'll try that again. Oh, yeah, it's still hard to see, but at least it looks a little bit better. What I did was I, um, uh, corresponding to the, uh, uh, the sprout, scab, or healthy type, uh, what I did was I assigned them numbers. So, uh, for example... Sprout uh, was given a value of 2, added a variable to the data set corresponding to that, and then I simply used the, the parallel coordinates plot function in uh, the IC plot package, and so that I could easily highlight those that are number 2, 
and so that we can see that where sprout is throughout the plot. So there's sprout, here's scab, uh, and this is especially illuminating in the fact that, you know, we see lots of scabs way up there uh, for density, for example, so that while we do have a lot of uh, lower values for density, we also have some middle and even high values of density for scab, which, you know, potentially could cause us some problems. I also did some parallel coordinates plots as well, as you've seen in the past. You know, uh, three, par uh, three principal components might be okay. Two, you know, you only get 65% of the total variation taken, but still, you know, it gives you the best two-dimensional representation of your data, so it's still helpful to look at. And this is what we get for those plots. So again, green is scab, and we can see some separation of the greens from the reds and the, and, and the blacks, indicating to us once again that we might have some success, but we do still see some overlap of the greens with the reds and the blacks, indicating that, well, well, we'll have some success, we'll also have some failures in, in, our, in our classifications, most likely. Uh, here's a bubble plot. A uh, nice little version of a bold plot is I put the, I know it's kind of hard to see, but I, I put the actual observation number in the middle, getting all the codes on my website. Here are some 3D plots of the principal components. You know, one of the things to notice here is that it doesn't really look like the third principal component is going to be any help to us in, in, in viewing differentiation between uh, the different uh, kernel types. Okay, so finally then we get to the actual model that we're interested in. So this is what I want to estimate. So how many parameters am I going to estimate? How many betas? Excuse me? J minus one? Uh, higher, higher. We'll play prices, prices right today. Higher than J minus one. And notice J, capital J here is 3. So higher than uh, 3 minus 1. Yeah, so I have 14 betas. You know, keep that in, in, in mind here. You know, this is a uh, you know, bigger model. And one reason why I bring this up is that, you know, let's say if capital J was larger than just 3. You, know, you can see that the number of betas that you're going to be estimating, you know, can grow kind of quickly. Um, <clears throat> so, now, we need to figure out for this lowercase j here, 1, 2, and 3, the way that we had introduced this in terms of notation, what is r going to then treat as j equal 1? Is it going to be healthy, scab, or sprout? What's going to be j equal 2? What's going to be j equal 3? And this goes back to what we've seen in the past about uh, understanding how r orders uh, the levels of a qualitative variable. If you remember, it has this numerical alphabetical ordering structure. So 0 through 9, and then, uh, you know, the lowercase letter is less than you could say than the corresponding uppercase letter. So in this particular case, then, healthy is going to be first. It's going to be J equal 1. Next would come scab. Next would come sprout. A quick way to always determine that, in case we haven't seen this before, is to use the levels function. So the, the variable type in my weak data set uh, contains the, the three different kernel types. Um, and if you just simply use levels with it, you can see how R is actually going to order everything. This is the default. There are actually ways to change that. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it here, but if you're interested, um, uh, post something to the listserv and I can, sh I can show you there. But generally, for our purposes, there's no reason to change the ordering. Okay. So let's estimate the model. So again, the function that I want is in the NNET package. And I'm going to estimate the model with the multinome function. It has a very similar syntax to what we've seen before. You know, use the formula argument to specify the model in terms of the response and the independent variables. You put in data for your data set. My data happens to be in an object called week 2. 
Um, and notice I don't need to specify like with a with the GLM function. I don't need to specify specify like my family and stuff because it, this by default assumes that you are using the kind of uh, multinomial regression model that I just presented. Again, there are other kinds of regression models for multinomial responses. We'll look at one a little bit later, but um, uh, you will not be responsible for it in this class. We're going to put all the results into an object called mod.fit. We then ha have some information about uh, the model fitting. The key thing to look at here is converged. You know, of course, with any kind of numerical iterative procedure, you're not necessarily guaranteed con uh, uh, convergence. But since it converged here, that means my beta hats are not changing from one uh, generally speaking, it means it's not changing from one successive iteration to the next. I can then summarize the information in mod.fit, just like what we did with logistic regression, and this is what we get. Okay. So we have scab sprout here. Notice you don't see the word healthy. That's because that scab is telling us this is the comparison between scab and healthy. This is then sprout there means this is a comparison of sprout to healthy. Because since healthy was j equal 1, this is our baseline category. This is the thing that we're comparing everything to. So that's why you don't see the word healthy there. So essentially this is j equal 2, j equal 3. And then in the intercept column, what this means in this 30.54 represents beta hat. Uh, to 0. The 19.16 is beta hat 30. Some people, um, first time that they see one of these models, they find it kind of odd you don't see a subscript 1 anyplace because in terms of the beta hats, you, know, you don't see beta hat 1 0. Well, that's because, again, how the model is structured. You know, you're comparing category J to category 1 always. Uh, underneath, underneath moisture, then we have beta hat 2.6, beta hat 3.6. So if I just uh, temporarily uh, jump ahead here, or actually let me do a split screen. Given all those beta hats, this is what then our estimated model looks like. And again, notice how I'm essentially using two lines to represent one model here. You know, first comparing scab to healthy and then sprout to, uh, to healthy. Notice also how I put the hats on top of the pies because now this is my estimated model. Any questions? So then also we have then us, uh, well, hold on a second, get ahead of myself. So notice here in the output we have something called class SRW. And we have the class variable and R has added SRW to it. Remember class is either HRW, hard red winter wheat, or SRW, soft red winter wheat. So what this is representing then is that um, R has created an indicator variable that's equal to a 1 if you have soft red winter wheat is equal to a 0 for hard red winter wheat. So that's what that class SRW means. Well, why did R choose to construct an indicator variable like that? Well, the reason is it all comes down to, again, how R treats um, uh, uh, qualitative or character variables. If you were to order, in alphabetical order, HRW and SRW, HRW would, of course, come first. By default, all R always makes that as the, let's say, the zero value. And then the second level becomes the one value for an indicator variable. In general, and we've uh, kind of discussed this before. Let's say if I had a four-level qualitative variable that had levels A, B, C, and D in it. Well, how would R treat this 
uh, if you put them into a formula argument. Well, R would create three indicator variables. Let's just call X1, X2, and X3, where X1 would represent the B level, X2 represents C, X3 would represent the D level, uh, where everything essentially will be compared to the A level there, because notice that's all zeros. Again, if you need re, uh, some help on working with qualitative variables, please see my STAT 870 lecture notes. I believe it's chapter 8. Continuing looking at this output here, we have uh, STD errors. Uh, what that represents is the standard errors. So in other words, this 4.28 is the estimated variance of beta hat 2, 0 square rooted. That's my what statisticians, again, call standard errors. Square root of the estimated variance of the statistic. Inside of then mod.fit, the, the object that we got back from multi-null, we have a, a lot of information. If you do a names of mod.fit, you can see the information that's actually in there. There's going to be uh, just a few things in there that's going to be very important to us. In particular, the most important thing is there's something called fitted.values. We actually saw that before with the GLM function. And what this gives you is for your observed data itself, your pi hats, essentially. So for the first observation, pi hat 1, probability you're healthy, is 0.85. For the second observation, I'm sorry, for the first observation again, the probability it's scab, pi hat 2. And lastly, probability sprout is pi hat 3. So, how could we use this then for classification? What do you think? What's that? Healthy. Healthy, yeah. Because that pi hat is the largest. So what your model is suggesting then is that the highest probability for the response is healthy. So, how about we just simply classify that observation? Or in other words, make a prediction for the population for this observation. Let's predict it to be healthy. That's simply how we use the model. Just like what we did with logistic regression, we only had two categories in that case. Now we have three, but we're always looking at the highest probability. That's it. And essentially, what you see here, too, is the results of resubstitution. I'll just say resub. Well, why is that the main purpose in this class? Um, we could still uh, do some significance tests. In other words, Suppose that you want to do a hypothesis test that looks like this. The null hypothesis is beta 2i is equal to beta 3i is equal to 0. In other words, let's say for the ith variable in your data set, are the betas equal to 0, which would mean then that variable wouldn't be needed in the model, versus is at least one of them not equal to 0. We could do a hypothesis test like that. There's a variety of different ways. The way that you're responsible for is to do a likelihood ratio test. If you remember from working with the GLM function, there was a function called ANOVA, capital ANOVA that is, from the CAR package, which provides us the necessary tests. So for example here, for density, this gives us information about the test of let's see, beta 2, 0 is equal to beta Oops, sorry, 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 sorry. Beta 2, 2, 
beta 3, 2 is equal to 0 versus at least 1 not equal to 0, we can see that the p-value is very small from doing this Likert ratio test. So that means that there's significant evidence, or there's sufficient evidence to indicate that density is important in predicting scab, sprout, or healthy, given the other variables are in your model. So weight also is important. Hardness, well, it's kind of marginal evidence. It's a low p-value, but definitely not really, really low. And then for class, size, and moisture, there's not sufficient evidence to indicate that those particular variables are important, given the other variables in your model. Are there any questions? So, that served as a brief introduction to what multinomial regression is. And now we can get to what the main purpose is, and that is for prediction. We kind of just did that already, but we're still going to look at a few other things uh, along with this. Would you use that analysis of variance for model selection? You could, depending upon how you're approaching model selection. You know, one way to do model selection is through, um, you know, uh, uh, like a backward selection, a forward selection. And so you could use that for, for variable selection. Um, you know, other ways to approach the problem will be, for example, to use like an AIC instead. Um, so those are some possibilities. So this is one we get, right? What's that? This is the, the output we get. We don't get an AIC yet. There's actually an AIC that's given in the, the original summary output. I just I glossed over it because we're not actually going to be talking about variable selection here. Take that 875 if you want to hear more about variable selection. Um, okay, so multinomial regression for prediction. Here's what our pies looked like before in terms of the expressions in, our, in the context of our model. To come up with the pie hats, you put hats on top of the beta hats. You put in your x's that you observe or maybe new x's that you have that you want to make predictions for. You put them in your model, and that's how you get your pie hats out. That's what R did with that fitted.values portion of mod.fit. The way that we then make the decision about, well, which category do we uh, classify an observation in, 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 and we talked about this, and that is uh, categorize the, the observation to the category that has the highest probability. Very simple. Uh, that's typically how it's done. Um, you might remember um, when we were talking about logistic regression, we said, well, you know, you don't necessarily always have to go with the highest. Um, and then that led us to discussions of, for example, ROC curves and stuff like that. I'm going to postpone that kind of a discussion until the end of this section. So there's an interesting way that you can visualize then your model. Um, then that will allow you to uh, make these classifications if you only had, let's say, one variable. So let's say that I have these true models here. So these are, notice I don't have hats on top of the pies. These are, let's say, my true models. And I want to do a, a plot of what these models show me. Uh, similar to what we had with the weed example, I'm going to have three categories. So what I would like to do is actually plot these models. And you can plot these models using the curve function in much the same way as we've done in the past. Since we've done this in the past, I'm not going to go over the code directly here in class, but we are responsible for it. It's in that particular uh, program there. And this is what we get when we actually plot our model. So given what I uh, showed you for the model, you know, find pi 1, find the expression for pi 2, find the expression for pi 3, and you can use the curve function to plot the curves. So for population 1, it's represented in black here, there's a, what pi 1 looks like as a function of x. Pi 2 is represented in, in, um, in green, and then pi 3 is represented in red. 
So that's what the model looks like. You know, think back to what we saw before with the logistic regression model. You know, we have that what I refer to uh, as an S-like curve. Well, we kind of have that here too, except for now look at the red part there with the pi three. You know, if I have more categories, and depending upon what the betas are, you typically see something very similar where um, now you can imagine, let's say, in between the two uh, S curves there, the, the green and the black, now you will have another, let's say, mound-shaped curve for the fourth category. And so what we see here then is that for values of pi, I'm sorry, for values of X that are greater than 1.236, falls right about here. We see that the largest probability corresponds to pi 1. So for any x that's greater than 1.236, you would categorize that observation as coming from um, uh, the first population. I look at 1.129, we see that for values of x less than 1.129, population 2 has the highest probability, so I would categorize it that way. And then between 1.129 and 1.236, we see that the red uh, line there is the highest, corresponding to pi 3, so you would categorize it as population 3. So it's just, this just serves as a nice little visualization of what this model shows us. Obviously, the, uh, the, the, the problem with doing this is that, you know, you, need only, you can only have one independent variable to do a plot like this. Uh, but what you could do, depending upon the circumstances, is that, let's say, if you have, let's say, two variables, x1 and x2, well, maybe fix x2 at a, at a particular value, and now do this plot in terms of, uh, the pi's versus x1, or vice versa. You know, fix x1, do the pi in terms of x2. And this could be very helpful in situations when you're trying to explain what your model is showing in terms of these categor categorizations. Okay, so page 20. Okay, so let's apply this now to the weak kernels data set once again. Just to make sure that you're familiar or you follow how we are working with these pi hat equations, let's look at how we would have basically approach this from a by hand um, uh, setting. Um, so let's take a look at the very first observation. So here's the very first observation. Notice it's observed to be healthy. Density is 1.35. Moisture content is 12.02. It's a hard red winter wheat. So for the indicator variable for class, would this be a 0 or 1? It would be a 0. Okay. So now let's put this into our corresponding equations. I'm going to do a little split screen action here. So healthy, again, is the first category. So what I want to do is basically translate then uh, the equation that we see here now to what it would be for our particular model. Uh, so we start off with a 1 in the numerator. Then in the denominator, we have 1 plus. Now I need to do this sum that we see here. The j is going to be equal to 3. So we're going to have two terms. So I'm going to take E raised to the beta hat uh, 2, 0 plus beta hat 2, 1 times 0 for the fact that the class variable is hard red winter wheat. And you keep on going all the way to the moisture. So there's my X for moisture. And we have here beta hat uh, 2, 6. So that's the first term. And the second term then, uh, you're basically doing the same kind of calculation 
uh, for what would be uh, category three, which would be the sprout. So if you do all the math, high hat healthy is 0.8552, which matches what we had before. Oops. So what I did also in my program was I programmed in these, essentially these by hand formulas um, uh, and, and put them into, into the syntax of R. I will let you look at the details on your own and you can see what my probabilities ended up being and how they match what we had before with mod.fit dollar sign fin dot values. There are other ways that you can get these pi hats out of R that can be useful. So for example, we can use the predict function, just like what we did with logistic regression. You put in for your first component, object equal, where you store the results from your model fitting function. I stored it in mod.fit. And then here's a new argument, type equal props, meaning I want the probabilities out. I put in an object called pi.hat and look at my results match. Again, this is basically through the results of resubstitution here. A nice uh, other uh, component of this predict function is that you can change the type argument to class for classify the, uh, the observation as one of the j different categories. So I'm going to put the results into classify and you can see for the first observation I get healthy because again the corresponding pi hat was the highest for healthy. So, <coughs> excuse me. So now let's relate these results to one of our earlier plots, a parallel coordinate plot. So we're going to look at observation 269. So I've highlighted two, observation 269 in my plot there. Uh, that's the thick line there. Uh, we've talked about how to highlight observations in the past, so that's why I'm not going to go through it here. Uh, but again, the code is in the program itself. And uh, this is the corresponding then actual values for observation 269. Notice it's a scab, so that's why I colored it in green. Now this particular observation, now look where it falls in terms of the weight, in terms of the size, in terms of the density. Notice how they're always low relative to the other kernels in your data set. Well, what does then the, um, uh, the model then predict in terms of these probabilities of the classification? So I just pull out observation 269 for my weak data set. Notice I use the new data argument, just like what you saw before with logistic regression. I use the new data argument to say which observation, whether it's new or if it's an old one I'm only interested in. And we can see, although I've written over it, that the probability at SCAB is 0.99. Now why did I show you this? Well, hopefully again, this should make sense that this is happening based upon what we saw in our parallel coordinates plot. That this observation should be classified as scab because you know, all around it are just scabs from what we saw in the plot. So as a way to check to make sure your model is doing something correctly or doing this correctly, you know, this, this can be helpful. Okay, so what about then, how accurate then is this model classifying our observations? What I can do is go back to a nice little function that I wrote along a few weeks ago, you could say, my summarize.class function, 
and use that to once again summarize the classifications. So the actual health, healthy sprout and scab uh, classifications are in the type variable of my week two data set. The classifications were obtained using the predict function and put into the object classify. And this is what we get. So healthy, 77% of the time it works. For scab, 77% of the time it works. Sprout, a little bit less, 61% of the time. Overall, my correct classification rate is 71.64%. This is very similar to what you had seen previously with like discriminant analysis in nearest neighbor um, classification as well. This, and as you'll see shortly, this is actually um, towards the best of all the methods. We also see what, we, what you've seen before too, in that you know, where, where is this model having problems? Well, it's having problems with the sprout stuff. Why? Well, you know, you can take a look at the plots. It, it makes sense of why it's having problems there. It's because of where sprouts falling on those plots. So again, this is for resubstitution. Well, what about? Um, well, let's say that you did have, let's say, a holdout data set, or maybe. You actually went out and collected some new data. How would you approach this? Well, similar to what we did with the logistic regression setting, you know, let's say that I have a new observation called new obs. And just to make things easy, suppose I just take the first observation out of the weak data set. We'll call that my new observation. And similar to what we saw with observation 269 before, you just use the new data um, argument to predict, get the pie hats out, and then you could also use the predict function with the, um, with the type equal class argument as well. But what about cross-validation? In this particular setting, we don't have a holdout data set. We don't have any new data that we could try this out on. So essentially, you're left with using cross-validation to get the best measurement of how good this model is in, in classifying. As we saw with the logistic regression model, there is not a nice way to do cross-validation in R in this particular kind of setting. We're going to have to write our own function. Okay. But fortunately, we can't use exactly the same function that we use with logistic regression. Uh, there, there's some, some issues with using that in that setting. So I had to write a whole new function here. Um, actually take a look at it. And you can see that it's longer than the one that we saw with logistic regression. But it's basically the same concepts that we saw previously in terms of you're going to basically try to repro reproduce what we had done with resubstitution except for we remove one observation at a time so that we can then classify that observation and then uh, collect all the results. Okay, so in my function itself, well, the function is called CD2. I'm going to pass in two bits of information, the model, in terms of the actual formula for the model semen, and the data set name. Let me just run that in there so we can look at what happens when we actually run the function. So CD2 model equal what we had saw previously in my multi-null call, I just put in the, the function name, and also here's my data set name as well. So if I run this, let's see what comes out. Might take a little bit. If I do names save.cv, you see that there are two parts that come out the probabilities and the classification. So here are the probabilities. So for example, for the first observation in the uh, weak data set, the estimated probability that's healthy is 0.848, and that is from cross-validation. 
Before, with resubstitution, we had 0.8528. So you can see it's very similar. For scab, before we have 0 0.0469. With resubstitution, we, I'm sorry, with cross-validation, we have 0 0.048. And then lastly, for sprout, cross-validation 0.1. And it was just about the same for resubstitution. So not a whole lot of differences. Now if we take a look at then classified, we have then the actual cross-validation results from classifications. Okay. So let's take a look inside the function itself. First thing I do is I find my overall sample size. And then I will let you look at some of this, uh, these components uh, alone here or, or after class. These three lines of code, which I do have you know, nicely commented there, allow me to determine the number of populations that I am working with. Um, if I wanted to, I could have just put in an additional argument here called num.pop and then actually pass in the number of populations. That's three in this particular case. Instead, I just like I just decided to do maybe something a little bit fancier um, where I would have the code actually determine it for me. So how would you walk through this code? What would you do to figure out what each line of the code does? Try it. Try it? How? Start what? Start moving things and see what goes wrong. Start moving things? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what I mean by moving things, but I, I, maybe you're getting at this. So what you could do is set the model value based upon whatever you want. Set the data set value based upon whatever you want. Because right now, if I just ran this code here, error. So I can't just execute it. The way that you figure out how our functions work is you simply, for the arguments here, set them to what you want them to be, and then just walk through this line by line, execute each line one at a time, and look at what's returned to you. That's how you figure out what a function does. So do that on your own. Then here, I set up a matrix to save all my pi hats in from doing the cross-validation. And what's different than, also what's different from what we did with logistic regression, I set up a vector here to store the actual classifications. In the logistic regression setting section, we actually did the classifications outside, my, outside the CV function. Here, it actually, um, it was a little bit easier to do it inside, so that's why I decided to do it this way. Here's a new function we haven't seen before called character. And what this is simply doing is creating an, or initializing a vector of character values of size n. So then, just like what we saw with the logistic regression setting, I do a for loop. I fit my model without the rth observation in it. I find the corresponding predictions using my predict function. So these are all my pi hats. I put them into my pi.hat.cv save matrix. And then also I put the predictions in there as well. In order to format everything nicely, I had to use a, a function called as.character. Try it without it. You can see that it doesn't work. If you try it with it, it does. And that's, again, how you figure out what this code does. And then, I, uh, and then this is my for loop. And then in the end, I return the pi hats and the, and the classifications. So once I get then the classifications, I can run my summarize.class function and see what the overall results are. Um, and so for healthy, 73% uh, correct, correctly classified, scab 72%, sprout 60%. And as we would expect, these values are a little bit lower cross-validation than for resubstitution, but they're fairly close to resubstitution. My overall correct percentage was 68%. Uh, with resubstitution, we had 70, about 72%. Okay. Now, similar to how uh, uh, we 
And in the place kicking example, um, it's always good to, uh, or typically in these kinds of settings, you're going to apply a, a, a number of different classification methods. And you want to then compare how they've done so you can make a judgment of which classification method that you want to use in the end. And so using then um, the same kind of functions that we saw with religious regression, I, I did a trellis plot to help me summarize the different methods that we've seen so far associated with this particular data set. So on the x-axis here we have accuracy. On the y-axis then we have the different method that was applied. Uh, QDA stands for, again, the quadratic discriminant analysis. We have two nearest neighbor classification methods, k equals 6 and k equals 11. We have the multinomial regression model that we just got done talking about. And then we have linear discriminant analysis. Then in the panels of the uh, trellis plot, I have overall, overall accuracy. But then I also have break up the accuracy in terms of the sprout, scab, and healthy classifications. So we can see here, overall, it looks like multinomial and quadratic discriminant analysis give the overall best results. Not too different from linear discriminant analysis. There might be some justification to use linear discriminant analysis. Um, but you know, it looks like with nearest neighbor, nearest neighbor is not doing as good. And so I would typically, if I were only interested in the overall accuracy, I'd probably pick from those three. Um, and to be honest, I'd probably use multinomial. The reason being is because it would give me a way to interpret my model, which discriminant analysis really doesn't do a very good job at. I know we haven't talked about interpretation too much, but if you take Stat 875, you'll learn about how you can interpret your model. And sometimes both interpretation and classification are our goals. So for example, in 875, we talk about, you know, what is the effect that density has on these different classifications. And we come up with like a basically a one sentence way to interpret it. Um, and then you can look at sprout, scab, and healthy. So you can see that multinomial does uh, uh, essentially the best with um, healthy, but then it starts to uh, not do as well with scab as compared to, let's say, quadratic. That's where its, <laughs> its strengths are. And, you know, if if you're really concerned about, let's say, one of these three different classifications, and then this plot then can really help you focus then on determining, well, which method to use. Are there any questions? Okay. That might be a good place to stop then. We have just a few more pages to go in these lecture notes. Uh, then we will uh, briefly talk about the testing means section. Uh, you don't really need to print off the notes. You're welcome to if you want to, but you, um, you don't need to print off the notes and bring them to class. We'll talk about the testing means section for five minutes, and then we'll just simply review for the final exam. So please come prepared to ask questions if you have them. Okay? That's it for today.